The chair recognizes the honorable member for St. Hannibal's. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise on behalf of the great people of St. Barnabas, namely the communities of Coconut Grove, Big Pond, Black Village, Oaksfield and Rock Crusher, uh, grateful to Almighty God for allowing me to see another day on this earth and another day in our beautiful country, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, as we get ready to celebrate uh, 51 years of independence, uh, Madam Speaker, and I will continue to contend Justifiably, I believe, until breath is taken out of my body, that the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is the greatest nation in the world, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want to thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, say what? I want to thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, for allowing some latitude today in this debate relative to the issue of relevance, Madam Speaker. And I, I don't say that, Madam Speaker, sheepishly. I do say that, um, since, I, say, I do say that sincerely, Madam Speaker. No, I do say that sincerely, Madam Speaker, because I believe that uh, it is really added to the discussions here uh, this morning and this afternoon. Um, and it's good for democracy and good for the Bahamian people uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, in that vein, Madam Speaker, before I get to the bill, uh, Madam Speaker, just wish to talk about two very important items, Madam Speaker, and I won't be on those items long. As a matter of fact, my contribution, Madam Speaker, <laughs> I don't, one is not the unification of the Valley Boys. There's only one Valley Boys, <laughs> Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, this issue, and I am glad that the Prime Minister uh, is in the chambers, Madam Speaker, and not to suggest that he wouldn't have heard it if he wasn't here, but I'm just glad that he's here, that this issue of what businesses are feeling what they deem as this level of assault on businesses in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is shameful. shameful and it continues to anger and outrage, not just businesses, Madam Speaker, but outrage Bahamians from all walks of life, Madam Speaker. Let me just say that, and I'm sure every member opposite uh, will emphasize this, we believe that uh, Bahamians, businesses uh, should comply with the law and whatever is owed to the government um, uh, and the Bahamian people should be paid. And so this isn't an issue of being anti-compliant or supportive of businesses that do not uh, pay what they're supposed to pay or follow the rules and the laws. But it's evident and it's clear to the Bahamian people. Yes. You know, sometimes they call it the eye test, Madam Speaker, that if you look at something, sometimes you could just look at something and say something is wrong, something is amiss. Mm -hmm. And the reality is for businesses, Bahamian businesses, to see armed, armed personnel, heavily armed personnel coming into businesses, Madam Speaker, it is a real problem in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It sends a bad signal, Madam Speaker. It sends a bad, a bad signal to entrepreneurs in this country and people who want to get involved with business. Uh, and there has to be a better way, Madam Speaker, other than having four, five, and six armed guards coming into a business, Madam Speaker, when you think about the impact of that. 
as I've said, Madam Speaker, we're not talking about um, endorsing businesses that are not compliant with the law or what is expected of them. But something clearly is wrong to the point now where businesses and um, uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce and so forth are, are talking about this issue. And so, you know, Prime Minister, I see that you're here, sir. Um, it is something that has to be addressed. There has to be a better way. I talked about it uh, last week. Can you imagine the impact of... Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Cat Island Rumkins is out. I accept what the St. Barnabas said. And I, 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 I'm too... I was moved by what I was saying. Um, it, was, it was the thought of it was the enforcement unit. They thought they had to show force to enforce. Um, but in this instance, I have I've expressed that there is a better way, as you have pointed out, and that better way will be employed going forward. I don't expect to see um, scenes as we have seen this going around in the viral um, men going into businesses unless it's, it is a necessary escalation of issues that might apply. And in some instances, the advice I was given was that, was, that the armed force was present because, that they, because they were collecting cash as well as at some, from some establishment, and they were there for the purposes of protecting the cash as they were going on. But it, was, it just spilled over into other areas. And so there'll be a demarcation where they're collecting cash and they need security for the cash or where they're just going to make inquiries about compliance. And those deep demarcations have been, um, have been, are now being implemented. So we don't expect to see that unless, as I said, it is in circumstances where, where, where cash is being collected from a business establishment and or in cases where there's some escalation of issue between the inquirers and the business places. So, the, as you say, there is a better way, and the better way would be employed. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister Mem Canada, Mankins, and Salvador. Uh, that is good to hear, Prime Minister, because as, as I also noted last week, when businesses last week were complaining about this, th um, this is not your contribution. You'll have your turn. You love your turn, and the prime minister and I were talking. I know you want to get there, but take your time. <laughs> this is the Davis administration, not Davis Cooper. <laughs> the point I just wish the well, I sometimes prime minister they confuse on that side. Some people say Davis, uh, Davis Cooper. Some people say Davis. I just let you know, prime minister, I'm not confused. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not confused, Prime Minister. Thank you. I just wanted to just make a point on there, Prime Minister, that, uh, you know, last week, and this is the reality for a lot of Bahamians. This is the reality that uh, when they juxtapose certain concerns and then they see other concerns. So as I said last week, that they see this level, this heavy handedness with businesses and armed persons walking in businesses, and then you have the unfortunate incident of the person being shot in the compound where you had the court and the police station. And a lot of Bahamians were wondering, how does that happen? Now, I'm not necessarily connecting the two. I'm making the point for the average Bahamian, and they see what is happening in businesses. And then they see this incident where that person was shot in the complex, steps away, well, in the court complex and steps away from, uh, from the police station. Uh, Madam Speaker, also, it was in the, what is in the parking lot next to the, next to the court. It's part of the complex. It's part of the complex. Uh, compound, right? Pink compound. Pink compound. Pink compound. Pink compound. Pink compound. Pink compound. The, the side plan says all one day. Also, <laughs> also. The side also. plan says all one day. <laughs> <laughs> also, 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 and Prime Minister, thank you so much for being so gracious in, uh, and answering the question. Also, this issue of CLECO policy holders. CLECO policy holders, they are upset that the government in this budget did not allocate any funding for them.
Yeah, so they, and, 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 and I, so let's just go ahead. And to recognize this honorable member for Kellen Rumkin and Salvador. I think you have to appreciate that, that, that the government, two administrations, the African administration and the PL administrations, right, thought that they would step in to assist CLECO, CLECO um, policy holders. Now we are assisting them from the public treasury. Some tax has been paid, money has been paid into the treasury by the Bahamian people. It wasn't that we found this money anywhere else to pay it. Now, we, no, we did not. We did not. I think I may have answered this if I hadn't. Yeah, you did. I, huh? I did. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, 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 no. We know. We don't have to propose that, man. We have been made aware. <laughs> <laughs> that that the that there has been a settlement with the liquidators and the and the Trinidadian uh, the Trinidadian, Trinidadian government or whoever the Trinidadian authorities that would be that would make that would make the Clico policyholders whole. Right? The issue we have at the moment is getting the liquidator present to sit down so that we could resolve these things. Right. I, I'm advised that the liquidators are proposing to, to pay, um, to, to declare a payment shortly. But we need to sit down and declare, see where we are, what government has paid out, because government will be entitled to receive their share of what's being paid back to the, to the liquidator, and then and ensuring that the policyholders get what is due to them. So that's all. That's so that's why. Knowing that the funds are available from the rightful source, there was no need for us to budget for it. If I may, so, okay, so the $110 million um, that uh, Chief Justice would have directed the, uh, uh, I think it's Baker Tilly to, to accept, right? But there's still an issue of when will that money be available? And isn't it so, Prime Minister, before you, before you respond, right? Isn't, isn't there, we don't, know, we don't know when that money is coming. So why in the meantime, doesn't the government still just stand in the gap? Stand in the gap, particularly because, and correct me if I'm wrong, that each of these policyholders would have executed an assignment, um, an assignment of their dividends to the government so that when the monies come in, the government would be repaid anyway. So why not pay the policyholders in the meantime, particularly that the government is going to get the money? Because right now, um, the policyholders, ten about 10,000 of them feel as though the government has abandoned them on this issue. And the government directed them to pay the, the premiums and so forth. I am, well, I, I, I'm surprised that the 10,000 believe that we'll abandon them. I, I think once they appreciate, we, we, we took the view, that these funds are readily available, and, and, and they should be ready, readily available. I, and um, the, I, I don't want to say what, what steps the government is going to take to make sure they're readily available, but I know that the finance sector was given some specific instructions by me last week in respect to getting the liquidator's attention to resolve this matter in the very immediate term. But in any event, Right. We have not abandoned them. The fact that we have not budgeted, and if, if, there's, if there's a need to, to step in, the government will step in. But we don't see that need right now. We're going to step in to ensure that the liquidator does his job and discharges his job um, appropriately. And, and that's what we wait for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Madam, Madam Speaker, this debate today on the longevity and regenerative therapies bill is a very complex, uh, complex but interesting one, Madam Speaker. Uh, just on that initial point about the bill, I do believe that making the public more aware 
of what the government is trying to achieve with this particular bill. Because a lot of this is seeped with a lot of technicality, um, particularly in the field of medicine, uh, Madam Speaker. And so particularly with these kinds of bills, you know, public awareness, as we've talked about, members on this side have talked about, public awareness um, about its importance, uh, its impact, its benefit to the Bahamian people, that has, that has been expressed in different ways and articulated in different ways by members, particularly um, uh, from the government side. But the Bahamian people, uh, I feel, Madam Speaker, need to know exactly the impact of this, um, the benefits, the benefits not just economically, Madam Speaker, but the benefits to the Bahamian populace as a whole. I really believe that there needs to be more public awareness of this bill, um, its, its potential challenges, its uh, potential benefits, and how this positions the Commonwealth of the Bahamas um, in this particular field. I really think that is very, very important. And so I would encourage the government uh, to do that, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the member for Cal Island, Ron Keenson Salvo, the Prime Minister, um, uh, used a phrase that we use in here often, and it's a, it's a very good phrase, and it, it's very important, and it applies to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas in many different things, and that is, with this particular piece of legislation, positioning, positioning us as a global leader um, in this field, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, whether it's whether it's in financial services and other areas, one of the things that I constantly think about, Madam Speaker, and I thought about this as I get into some of my concerns here relative to this, is that we know one of the challenges that we face constantly as a people is that we are always under extra scrutiny in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Um, and uh, you know, it, it is because of the envious position that we hold um, in the world. Um, but we are constantly under extra scrutiny, Madam Speaker. So we have to be twice as smart. You know, we have to be twice as good. And even when it comes to regulation and so forth, just as in the financial services industry, we just, we just have to be twice as good as, re as, as coming up with regulation and regulating ourselves, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, the reason why I came from, from that particular angle, uh, Madam Speaker, is because as we bring these various pieces of legislation uh, to Parliament, particularly the ones that requires a great deal of heavy regulation in order for that long-term goal to be achieved, of whatever it may be, just as in this case, where the government sees um, uh, regenerative medicine in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, the issue of regulation, Madam Speaker, is a very, 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 very important, very, very important matter, Madam Speaker. So we know, just on what has been discussed today, Madam Speaker, uh, that that this bill does have far-reaching uh, reputational and ethical implications um, for our country. And so what has been said by us on this side is the concern about not having the level of consultation, honorable member for Tall Pines, the level of consultation, particularly as it relates to this type of legislation that has, again, so many far-reaching ethical and reputational implications for the Commonwealth um, of the Bahamas. And so we are concerned, we are concerned that the requisite personnel, bodies in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, particularly as it relates to 
the medical, um, medical bodies have not been consulted to the level, have not been consulted to the level, if at all, for something so important that we are now proposing will help us in our whole medical tourism bid, if you will, Madam Speaker. So we're concerned about that. We're also concerned, as the uh, member for St. Anne's um, talked about, and the member for Marco City, uh, when he got up on his feet, talked about the input of the church, and we know how important that is. Um, we are concerned, and we hope that the government, we hope that the government heeds this concern that we have. And I know that the member for Tall Bynes, uh, on a number of occasions um, today, has tried to allay that concern. But we are fundamentally concerned that this consultation has not happened at the level, this level, as fundamental as that should be, prior to, prior to us debating this bill here this afternoon, um, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, you know, when you think about concerns and regulation, and it's not about playing devil's advocate, but Oftentimes, when you, to understand the magnitude or the importance of one aspect um, of a bill or a piece of legislation, uh, you can go to where there are areas, as in this case, where you look at Section 17, Prohibited Acts, and the Prime Minister talked about it, Madam Speaker. Uh, but again, I wish to mention it, to emphasize, in my view and in our view, the magnitude and how serious this bill is and some of the blind spots, if you will, Madam Speaker, blind spots, if you will, where regulation is so important because of the impact of would-be bad actors, if you will, uh, Madam Speaker. Right? And so it says that no person genetically, sorry, no person or entity shall genetically modify a human embryo with the intent of that embryo becoming a living human. It's a serious business, Madam Speaker. No person or entity shall test gene therapies on patients without informed consent. No person or entity shall purposely modify the germline of an adult human. Madam Speaker, what they call those things, um, a member for tall pines, what's the technical term? Um, um, designer babies, they call them. Eh? Designer babies, they call them. Um, designer babies, they call them where persons are trying to, yeah, trying to create this baby that has, that fits every, I guess, every, every qualification that they believe should happen in a human being and so forth. And again, Madam Speaker, I heard the member earlier today about this is not about scaring, <coughs> scaring or fear-mongering or anything, Madam Speaker. This is just about legitimate concerns about the magnitude of what it is we are being asked to pass here and ensuring that the proper legislation is here. And that's why I go back, Madam Speaker, to something that impacts the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and the medical community in such a way why haven't we done the proper consultation? And I heard the member for Tall Bynes talk about uh, what could be done after the fact. But I, 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 would, I would argue that having the consultation to the level that we believe that has not happened and that we understand has not happened actually could avoid plenty issues down the road and some of the issues that the bill spells out and tries to, not tries, but definitely um, um, in word, does its best to prevent, Madam Speaker. Uh, so not just prevention in how the bill is set up, but in functionality. And I believe the best way to get there would have been to have the level of consultation, uh, Madam Speaker, that I believe that the Bahamian people would have wanted relative to this, um, Madam Speaker. Um, I am... Um, I am concerned, Madam Speaker, that 
there seems to be more of a focus. I'm not going to say that there's no focus um, on, on the other aspects, but there seems to be a strong focus on the economic impact, the business, the business of what this will bring, which is, which is important. Don't get me wrong, uh, Madam Speaker. It's, it's very, very important. Um, and so I offer, I just offer this concern. You know, when people are understandably, Madam Speaker, um, in need for use of medical uh, advancement and technology, because as the member for Central and South Galuthra talked about, talked about a situation with someone he's aware of who has a son um, who could use this type of medicine, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, I, I have special, like, like a lot of Bahamian families, um, special near children in, in our family where, uh, where you don't know necessarily why, or the, why their condition is what it is, or that the present um, medical apparatus, medical structure you have does not help, and this may. So I, let, me, let me just say that. So I, I fully, fully appreciate what the member for Central and South um, Luther talked about. Uh, what I'm talking about, Madam Speaker, is how do we, even in the best case, achieve what we want to achieve from an economic beneficial standpoint, um, a medical standpoint, while ensuring, and that's why I go back to regulation, ensuring that the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is protected from what we could see now by looking at this bill is some blind spots of what consultation could have fixed even before this bill, we attempt to pass this bill, Madam Speaker. Because again, as I said a couple of minutes ago, Madam Speaker, Commonwealth of the Bahamas is the envy of the world. And the irony of it is, right, as we aim to be global leaders in this area, it is going to come with extra scrutiny. It is going to come with extra scrutiny. As I said, you know, analogous to, you know, they don't want us in the financial services business, so they scrutinize us even harder. That's why we have to be twice as good and twice as smart in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And the good thing is God has blessed us and allowed us to be twice as good and twice as smart, Madam Speaker. So I apply um, that similar sort of assessment as it relates to this to ensure that we can withstand not only the scrutiny of those who don't want us to be in the business of regenerative medicine, but also the ability to deal with those quote unquote bad actors who are going to try to use this in some nefarious and frankly evil way. As a matter of fact, Madam Speaker, and not to suggest that members here are naive to this, there will be persons who will go to unsuspecting people and say, man, listen. I could get this done in the Bahamas. You know, they ain't got much regulation down there, right? Okay? You ain't got to worry about it. That's just the Bahamas. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that that means that they're right. I'm just saying particularly there will be people that will be their angle, you know? They ain't got no rules down there and so forth. So I'm just making the point about making sure that the regulation is of such a nature, nature and the consultation is of such a nature. And you're not going to... This is not a perfect world. You're not going to avoid people from trying whatever it is they're going to try. I'm just saying, Madam Speaker, because we have to be twice as good, twice as smart, we got to be three times better than them, so to speak, Madam Speaker. I believe that we need to focus more on the regulatory aspect of this, Madam Speaker, um, and how potentially harmful it can be to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas if those regulations aren't um, stronger. And again, Madam Speaker, it is concerning that the level of consultation, particularly with something like this, um, has not been had, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, 
Um, before, I'm, before I take my seat, uh, Madam Speaker, just wish to uh, let the great people um, of St. Barnabas know um, that we are continuing with um, the continuing education programs that we have. And they can check the constituency office, Madam Speaker. Um, we are big about the development of our people in every which way, um, particularly the young and those, those adults in the community who didn't necessarily uh, finish high school for whatever reason. And we're looking for ways that they can increase their skills, Madam Speaker, uh, because as my mama said, as long as you're in there, you can learn anything, Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker, I thank you very, very much for this opportunity to uh, contribute this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member Asim. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Exomers and Regular Island.